Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Today, we continue our sermon series on Nehemiah. And last week, Pastor Graham talked about how Nehemiah felt so burdened to pray and how he presented himself, his request before the king to rebuild Jerusalem. Now, this morning, we shall take a look at what happened to Nehemiah when he arrived at Jerusalem. But before we unpack the passage, will you join me in a word of prayer? God of heaven, open our ears that we may hear your word. Open our eyes that we may see your truth. And open our hearts that we may respond to you. By the power of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now on the weekend of September 22nd, Marina Bay transformed into a street circuit. 20 cars raced against each other at the F1 Singapore Grand Prix. But Clarence Lando Norris won the championship with Red Bull in second place. Now, the Singapore Grand Prix is the first ever nighttime race in F1 history, if you not already know. And Singapore has been hosting it since 2008. Each driver has to drive and complete 62 laps around the circuit. And each lap is around 4.94 kilometers. But I think as they drive around the circuit, what a beautiful sight it must have been to them. Because the city's skyline is at the backdrop, and they're just going round and round Marina Bay at night. What a beautiful sight. But during the Old Testament time, in 445 BC, someone went on a night circuit as well. Except that the view wasn't as spectacular as Marina Bay. In fact, the road condition was so bad that he couldn't even complete one single round. This brings us to our first point this morning, that is the secret mission. Look inward. The secret mission. Look inward. Now, in chapter 2, verses 11 to 12, Nehemiah had arrived at Jerusalem. After staying there for three days, he toured the city at night. But up to this point, he told no one what God has put into his heart to do at Jerusalem or for Jerusalem. And he brought along a few men with him. Now, notice Nehemiah wasn't driving in a McLaren or Ferrari or Red Bull. He rode in on an animal, on an animal, probably a donkey or a horse. So that means he couldn't go fast. No, zoom, zoom, no. But slowly, silently, he went in. And it was a secret mission. Secret mission because these missions usually happen at night with a few, a small group of people, and very few would know about it. And you will go in as stealthily, as silently as possible. But the question is why keep it a secret? Why not go on Instagram Live, announce to everyone, and get everyone involved in this mission? Here, I think Nehemiah is teaching us a valuable lesson. That is, to know the real situation on the ground, you need to go on a secret mission without any fanfare. Just a month ago, Grab CEO Anthony Tan, he went undercover as a private hire driver. He started driving on a Sunday afternoon in a Hyundai Kona EV car. In his personal vlog, he wrote, going on ground, is still the best way to test the Grab driver app in a real setting and get direct feedback from passengers. So as he drove, he empathized with the Grab drivers because they had to stay in a fixed position, posture, due to long hours of driving, continuously. So he said, wow, it's not easy. He only drove probably that one day or that one afternoon. Anthony's hands-on approach was lauded by many. By going undercover, it helped him get some real good ground truths and look inward at some of the internal operational issues. So similarly, Nehemiah felt that the best way to start his mission was to go on the ground, to look internally inward. Not Google, not chat GPT, Gemini, Gemini, not listen to outsiders, but first look inward. Thus, in verse 13, you see Nehemiah he started inspecting the city walls at night. The original Hebrew word for inspect means to examine. 
examine. The way a medical doctor would take a careful internal examination at the wound to see how serious or how extensive it is. And to do that, Nehemiah started from the valley gate, from the western part of the city. If you look at the screen, that's number one. He went downwards and reached down gate, the southern tip. That's number two. According to Old Testament scholar Derek Kickner, the down gate was a place where people discard and dump their garbage and broken pots. It's near this valley of Himnon where trash was burning continuously. It's like hell. As Nehemiah looked inward, he realized that, hey, the walls had been broken down. And in those days, walls were important because it's not just a structural defense, but it also demarcated the spiritual boundaries, the religious boundaries between Jerusalem and the pagan nations around it. That was critical. Nehemiah continued downwards, northwards, sorry, to the fountain gate and the king's pool. That's number three on the screen. Supposedly beautiful places, right? King's pool, etc. But now they are lying in ruins. Nowhere, nowhere like Marina Bay. In fact, the debris was so extensive that it obstructed Nehemiah in verse 14. He had to dismount from his animal. There was no room for his animal to pass through. And finally, Nehemiah decided that he had seen enough. Gao Liao. He turned back. He re-entered through the valley gate in verse 15. Now, pause for a moment. Imagine with me. If you were Nehemiah standing at ground zero, as you look at the ground, as you look inward, how would you feel? Nonchalant? Heart-wrenching? Or in Hokkien terms, we say, take sin. Because would you empathize with the situation on the ground? Would you empathize with the people who are living around there? Sometimes, looking inward, introspection is important. Because when we spend time, quiet moments at night, early morning, away from the crowd, away from the hustle and bustle, sometimes alone by ourselves, we get to properly examine the issue and reflect on our lives. Brothers and sisters, this morning, what is the Lord prompting you to look inward? Is there an area for introspection? At the church front, we may not have broken walls or destroyed gates, but we may have broken relationships that require mending. We may have people leaving our church gates for various reasons. At our work or studies, things may appear all right on the surface, but deep down, you and I know it's messy. Our work-life balance has been disrupted. You are spending less quality time with your friends, with your family members, with your children, with your parents, with God. Or perhaps it's a bad habit you have. And perhaps people have been reminding you about it, but you kind of know it, yet you prefer to avoid it. Some things are not easy to look at. It can be painful. But it's necessary. For Nehemiah, he's had to go to Jerusalem. That's his ground zero, his starting point. How about you and I? Where is our ground zero? Where is the Lord prompting you the first and the best place to start looking at? So that's our first point. The secret mission. Look inward. Let me move on. I have a few pictures to show you and I need all of you to help me. Okay, I need you to identify one object that appears in each of this picture. Are you ready? Okay, let's go. First picture. Ready, ah? Huh? Okay, second picture. Last picture. What's the obvious object? Elephant, right? <laughs> That's right. And even though the elephant is obvious in these pictures, the people seem oblivious to the elephant. Right? Even though the elephant is obvious, people seem oblivious to it. According to Cambridge Dictionary, the idiom, elephant in the room means there is an obvious problem or difficult situation that people do not want to talk about. Why? Because such issues are often difficult. 
it makes people feel awkward and they choose to remain silent, avoid it, or deny it altogether. In Nehemiah's case, he had an elephant in the room as well because he knew there's an issue in Jerusalem and now he has seen it for himself. What should he do? This brings us to our second point this morning, that is the spiritual motivation. Look forward. The spiritual motivation. Look forward. In chapter 2, verse 17, Nehemiah addressed the people like a town hall meeting, if you like. He said, you see the trouble we are in. How Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Well, Nehemiah could have stopped there just to confirm what the people had already known. It's not new news. It's old news. Because after all, it had been 13 years since Ezra's last rebuilding effort and Jerusalem had been lying there in ruins. People, everyone was probably lamenting about their situation, agonizing over it. But that's about it. Stop there. What truly differentiates Nehemiah as a leader is that he didn't stop there. He didn't. In the second half of verse 17, he said, Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer. Nehemiah was actually communicating both the situation and the solution to the people. You see that? He was transforming their agony into action. Nehemiah was mobilizing the people to look forward. Don't just fret at the situation. Find a solution. Don't get stuck in our former glory, but strive for future growth. Don't stay trapped in our present problem, but think of possible progress. Look forward. That's the difference. That's inspiration. That's vision. That's leadership. But that wasn't all. Nehemiah, Nehemiah knew he had to say or do something even higher or greater for the people. And that's the spiritual motivation. Spiritual motivation. Because people can fail us. Programs can fail us. Sometimes medical devices fail us. Sometimes technical devices fail us. What do you do? Look at the end of verse 17. Nehemiah said that we may no longer suffer derision. NIV translates the verse as no longer be in disgrace. You see, Jerusalem was once the city where the great and awesome God had put his name. 2 Kings chapter 21, verse 4. The Lord said, In Jerusalem will I put my name. And God's temper was in the heart of the city. But now, God's city and his temple had become a laughing stock among the enemies, among the neighbors. And as the pagans mocked, they were in fact laughing at God and his name. When God is mocked, God's people will suffer shame, division, disgrace. James Boyce the commentator said, Nehemiah therefore had to appeal to nobler instincts. He reminded the people of their spiritual ideals. Not just what they see on the ground, but something higher and greater. That is, if God's city, temper, name, honour were being mocked, how can God's people continue BAU, business as usual? How can God's people remain passive? Or in Singaporean terms, we say bochap. In preparing for this sermon, I came across a good online resource on Nehemiah written by Bishop Robert Solomon. He wrote a compelling quote, and let me share it with you. He said, The greatest motivation is the glory of God. When we can point others to the fact that what we are doing is for the name of the Lord, and that, what, and that He is with us and leading us in the world. Our church library has a copy uh, of this book, another book by Robert Solomon on Nehemiah. Feel free to borrow it. And I think that's the kind of motivation we need. 
a higher, greater spiritual motivation when things around us seemed gloomy and discouraging. A motivation that fixes our eyes on a greater purpose, on God and His glory. And praise be to God, the people there were convinced, they were convicted in verse 18, and so they responded in unison. Let us rise up and build. And they strengthened their hands for the good work. You see, they not only talk. Let's rise up and build, let's talk. No, they strengthen their hands. What does it mean? It means they walk their talk. They put their hands to the plow. Everyone. Brothers and sisters, are you and I also in need of spiritual motivation today? Maybe it's your spiritual life, your ministry. We have come to a point where you are feeling lukewarm, dejected, disappointed, discouraged. You are aware of the situation, but you no longer feel motivated to do anything to move forward. Perhaps it's your personal life. There's stress, depression, addiction to games, social media, online shopping. And these are slowly affecting you. You know it, but you haven't worked on possible solutions moving forward. Or maybe you notice an elephant in the room around you. And sometimes you're just not sure how to approach it, how to address it. Today, Nehemiah points us to the spiritual and higher, greater motivation you and I need. To rise up and reclaim God's grace and glory in our lives, in our church. With God's help, I believe you and I can move forward, can look forward together. In spite of the present situation, and the people who sometimes disappoint us. That's the second point, the spiritual motivation. Look forward. Let me move on. Thus far, we have seen how Nehemiah embarked on a secret mission to look inward. Also, we have seen how Nehemiah engaged his people into a spiritual motivation to look forward. And now we shall consider a third and final point this morning. That is, the success measure, look Godward. The success measure, look Godward. In verse 19, as soon as the rebuilding started, news reached the ears of three characters. Who are they? Sambalat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite, and Geshem the Arab. The first two were mentioned earlier in verse 10. They were very much disturbed by Nehemiah's effort to rebuild Jerusalem. Time doesn't allow us to dive deeper into the historical details this morning, but suffice to say, biblical writer Raymond Brown suggested these three opponents had different reasons against Nehemiah. You see them on the screen. Sambalat, political greed, Tobia, religious ground, and Geshem, material gain. So these three musketeers, they decided to gang up together against Nehemiah. What did they do? They started jeering at the people, despising them in verse 19. What is this thing you are doing? Come on. Are you rebelling against the king? These enemies knew they couldn't attack Nehemiah with weapons. weapons. Sorry. <laughs> With weapons because the king had given the approval to rebuild Jerusalem. So any attack on Nehemiah and his plan would be regarded as a revolt against the king. So the enemies changed their tactics. They mocked and ridiculed the Jewish builders who were ordinary people. In other words, they cast doubts on their ability to rebuild. Next, the enemies used a more serious threat on the Jews. They cast doubts on their allegiance. Are you rebelling against the king? Of course, you and I know that the enemies were lying because the king had already given them the green light to go ahead. These enemies, they were in fact trying to sabotage and undermine Nehemiah's success. 
a year ago, then DPM Lawrence Wong launched the Forward Singapore Festival. In his speech, DPM Wong said, the Singapore dream is no longer solely about material success. Singaporeans today no longer talk so much about the five Cs. Those of us who are older, I think you and I remember the five Cs. What are they? Cash, credit card, car, condominium, and country club membership. These five Cs. Rather, Singapore needs today to embrace a wider definition of success. And this includes fulfillment, meaning, and purpose in people's life. For Nehemiah, he had a very different success measure from his enemies. Nehemiah replied in verse 20, this way to his enemies, the God of heaven will make us prosper. NIV uses the word success. He continued by saying, we, his servants, will arise and build. If you look carefully at these underlying words, God, us, we, his servants, do you notice any relationship there? Nehemiah measured success in this covenantal relationship between God and his people. On the other hand, the enemies measured success in the construction of the city walls. The enemies look at the project, the city walls. But Nehemiah is different. He looks at the purpose behind the project, the covenantal relationship between God and his people. That's why Nehemiah, Nehemiah declared in verse 20 that Sambalat, Tobia, and Geshem would have no portion, no right, or no claim in Jerusalem. Why? Because these opponents simply had no relationships with God. You see that? So, no, nothing for them, not even a single cent for these opponents, for these enemies. In the face of oppositions and trials, Nehemiah had nowhere and no one else to turn to. And he turned and he looked Godward. Godward. He put his confidence in the God whose gracious hands had been behind the project in verse 18. The Apostle Paul in Romans 8 verses 31 to 32 assured us the same thing. He said, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, referring to Jesus, graciously give us all things? Who were Sambalat, Tobia, and Geshem compared to the Almighty God? Nehemiah knew his success measure. He looked Godward and to trust God and trusted God to graciously guide him along. Brothers and sisters in Christ, when was the last time you and I looked Godward? The circumstances around you weren't looking good. Your toxic work culture, your rebellious teenage child, the demanding education system, the rising cost of living, an illness that has been plaguing you for so long. Or for some of us, we have become too reliant on our own cleverness, our own capability, competency. We don't rely on God, actually. Think about that. We measure our own success according to our own possessions, our positions. Here, Nehemiah chose to look Godward. He made God his success measure. Never mind Sambalat, Tobia, or Geshem. Never mind how the people laughed at or despised him. Nehemiah fixed his eyes on God. His confidence rested securely in this covenantal relationship between God and his people. How about you and I? What measure of success are we using today? So that's our third and final point. Look Godward our success measure. Let me conclude. From the, from the moment Nehemiah set foot on Jerusalem to the time where he gave a motivational talk to the Jews, there were at least three key takeaways. First, the secret mission. 
We need to first look inward to understand the situation and empathize with the people on the ground. In church, at the workplace, in school, back in our family, we cannot just manage from afar. Second, the spiritual motivation. We need to look forward to transform our agony into action with God's glory as our highest motivation when things around us look gloomy, discouraging. And third, the success measure. We need to look Godward to find confidence in our covenantal relationship with God, whose gracious hands will see us through. Where are you and I looking this morning? May the Lord help us. Let us pray. God in heaven, you are the almighty and gracious God. Encourage us to first look inward before we look outward. To look forward instead of backward. And most of all, to look Godward and nowhere else. By the power of the Holy Spirit. In the blessed name of our Saviour, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.